Okay, so um, let's uh, welcome Professor Jonathan Holm from ETH Zurich uh, for this. This is a very different topic from what you have been learning so far, right? And this is um, trapping charged particles with both electric and magnetic fields. And for me, it is, it is particularly very, very uh, relaxing to hear more about what I knew maybe 10, 15 years back or used to work on that. And the field has progressed quite a lot. Um, and I, I guess Jonathan will tell you much more in depth and with penning traps and what they're good for, and particularly also in terms of application. Please, the floor is yours. Okay, thanks very much uh, for the intro. Indeed, uh, this is a different topic. I, I discussed with the other iron trap lectures of the course before we gave our lectures, if you like, and uh, I very much felt uh, we've started a project on these penning traps, and I very much felt that this is an area that uh, should be of interest and complete a picture of any iron trap physics. Uh, most of the quantum control uh, experiments that you see in trapped ions today and most of the groups work on uh, pole traps, so radio frequency fields are used to confine the ions. Uh, penning traps are different, they offer different opportunities uh, and they offer different constraints and so I wanted to uh, share some of the really nice physics that's gone on in them uh, over the last even decades. Okay. So uh, this is illustrated, if you like, by something that's very hard to achieve in an RF pull trap, uh, which is this picture that you see here from John Bollinger's group uh, at NIST in Boulder. Uh, what you see is really this, these are all individual atoms, right? These are um, essentially beryllium uh, ions, right? And you see this beautiful two-dimensional uh, crystal uh, of ions on this triangular lattice. Uh, and John does these very nice quantum simulation type experiments where he uses this interacting triangular lattice to develop spin models uh, and explore the physics of that. Uh, that's just one aspect where uh, this is something which is still in the future really for um, pull traps, but where penning traps have been very strong producing nice uh, two dimensional crystals. So uh, we should start by asking uh, what is a penning trap? And in fact, the first part of the talk will uh, tell you about that because it's, uh, I think, or I personally find it non-trivial to think about penning traps. Uh, they, they, I'll tell you why that is in a moment, but let's just uh, think why we need them. So you will have encountered previously in the set of lectures on ions that uh, when you have a single charge, then Laplace's equation tells that you that you cannot confine uh, a single charge uh, with static fields. And that's, you can think of it like this, that uh, uh, two of these curvatures, uh, if they are positive and are confining the particle in those two dimensions, you have to have anti-confinement in the other dimension, right? So the ion will roll off down the hill and, and, and be lost. And there's two ways that you can think of uh, to solve this problem. So the one that we've, uh, you've probably dealt with up till now in these lectures is to use dynamic fields, and that's called a pull trap. And I think that's been probably the basis for every talk uh, that you've seen so far. So the solution that I'm going to talk to you about today is, is different, uh, that we come with static fields, so static electric fields, which will suffer from Laplace's equation problem, if you like, but we supplement that by a homogeneous magnetic field uh, and uh, thus provide the fault trapping. So um, let's think about a simple uh, static uh, field, and in fact, a particularly simple form of penning trap potential, so what you see here is a electric potential in space, uh, which confines particles along the z-axis. But you see this minus sign tells us that there's anti-confinement along the x and y-axis. I'm going to refer, refer to them as radial and use the coordinate system with the z-axis and, and a radial coordinate system in the xy-plane. So I've plotted such a potential uh, here. Yeah. And the thing that supplements that in the penning trap is a magnetic field, which lies along the Z axis, right? So it lies along the confining uh, plane. So I'm kind of gonna ignore the uh, axial motion uh, for much of the discussion. And the reason for that is that in a sense, it's kind of normal, right? What is it? There's a confined uh, harmonic oscillator potential, and we will get a standard harmonic oscillator in that axial direction along this Z axis. So the more complicated thing happens for the uh, 
uh, radial axes where you see here anti-confinement and a charge will fall down this potential hill, except that the magnetic field provides a Lorentz force, right? And the Lorentz force tells you uh, that you get a force which is perpendicular to both the velocity uh, of the atom and to the magnetic uh, field. Okay, so what, what can we think about in those terms? Sorry, I got distracted by the chat slightly. Uh, is that uh, as this particle starts to fall down this potential hill, it will accelerate radially, right? It'll get some radial uh, velocity. And then the Lorentz force, which has to be perpendicular to the field and that velocity, will take you round the magnetic field, right? And it's this which is providing then the confinement in the Penning trap. So um, why, what is it that's interesting about Penning traps from the point of view or by the comparison with uh, Paul traps? There are a number of things, and I'll come back to that uh, a little bit later, which is actually a reason why I'm getting into this game uh, myself. But one of them which is uh, very clear is that this now is a system where you have static fields, uh, where both static magnetic and static electric fields. And that sort of, uh, I give you a general notion that these can be extremely stable. And that's one of the major benefits of using penning traps. Uh, the other thing which uh, I'll focus on later is that there's no power dissipation in these traps. So you can uh, build uh, penning traps and you don't have to input uh, power. Apart from, I mean, usually to generate magnetic fields, you do that using currents. So if there's any, uh, usually that's done with a superconducting magnet. If there's any dissipation there, there is a bit of a power requirement. So the primary thing is that uh, the stability is very good uh, in these traps. So uh, where do they feature? Actually, they feature in the history of iron traps pretty strongly. In fact, in the history of laser cooling pretty strongly because uh, the first laser cooling, Doppler cooling experiments ever done were done uh, in uh, penning traps. Yeah. Um, that's this classic paper by uh, Wineland, Walls and Drulinger. Um, so uh, what's the use of them today? And I just selected out a number of them. Maybe I've missed a few of them, but I, I let me go through. Uh, one is in uh, precision measurement. So in particular, tests of uh, fundamental theories such as quantum electrodynamics. Uh, and one classic measurement there has been of the G factor of the electron. And I've underlined this line because I'll, I'll describe that measurement uh, in a little bit of detail later. They get used in uh, dealing with, uh, as I said, fundamental physics. So one of the classic experiments going on today is the ratio of the proton uh, or the differences, if you like, between the proton and the antiproton charge to mass ratio. So that's trying to detect whether there's any difference between matter and antimatter, which is a very important question when we look at the large ratio between those two things in our universe. They get used in trying to make anti-hydrogen. So they, what you want to do is mix uh, anti-protons with uh, 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 anti-electrons, right? Uh, and so you've got a, traps there you want to store for a very long time. So uh, indeed, penning traps are used for that. And a classic example is by the alpha collaboration. At CERN. They're heavily used in mass spectrometry as, as mass filters. Uh, and then the other things which are more related to quantum, which I wanted to mention, are quantum simulation with 2D lattices. And you saw already this sort of plane of uh, ions on a 2D lattice at NIST. Yeah. And then I, I'll tell you at the end how this may move towards, and in fact, Imperial have done experiments over a number of years towards quantum computing. Uh, and that's an area that my group is uh, starting to work in now. And I want to show you a little bit about why I think that's interesting. So, when we think about motion in a penning trap, we have to deal with uh, the uh, kinetic energy, the potential energy, and the magnetic uh, term, right? Uh, and that magnetic term adds a reasonable amount of complexity that's not sort of in your most basic treatments of mechanics. And that's why I'm going to tell you a little bit more about uh, that today, right? So I've drawn here uh, this Lagrangian of our system. Uh, in uh, cylindrical coordinates. And that's because we have a natural cylindrical uh, symmetry in this problem. Uh, that is the, around the magnetic field is, is symmetric, right? So there's some kinetic energy terms. There's this potential, uh, which you see repels uh, along the radial directions and confines along the uh, Z direction. And in addition to that, there's a magnetic field term, 
which uh, you will see involves uh, the radial coordinate squared and also involves the uh, angular velocity, right? And that's proportional to what we would call the cyclotron motion, uh, the cyclotron frequency, and I realize I haven't quite introduced that. That's basically the magnetic field divided by the mass of, or it's the charge times the magnetic field divided by the mass of the particle that you're using. So one key thing about this Lagrangian is it doesn't depend on the uh, radial coordinate uh, phi, i.e. the um, angular coordinate, right? And what that means, if you were to write down the Euler-Lagrange equation, so this is where you get your equations of motion, right? Uh, is that you would find that there's no uh, d by dl by d phi term, right? So what that means is that the canonical angular momentum, which is what you find in this uh, term here, uh, doesn't change in time, it's conserved in this system, right? Uh, and so if we differentiate this Lagrangian with respect to this uh, uh, velocity, uh, change in velocity, if you like, uh, what we find is that that's got a term coming from the magnetic field, yeah? And it's also got a term coming from the kinetic energy term that we see here. So there's contributions from this canon canonical, to this canonical momentum from the kinetic momentum, but that's different from the canonical momentum by this magnetic field term that we have with this cyclotron frequency. So we can derive uh, also a radial equation of motion. Uh, and the structure of that is such that you have the usual second order differential of your radial, of your coordinate, if you like. There's some term here, which actually looks uh, roughly like a harmonic oscillator type term, right? We've got some uh, parameter, which is positive, uh, delta squared times the radius, uh, uh, that's the sort of harmonic oscillator term. And there's a one over r cubed term here. And I just remind you that this canonical momentum is a constant. So you see a constant divided by the coordinate sitting on this right-hand side, right? So um, what's this uh, parameter that I'm drawing here, which is sort of related to a harmonic oscillator parameter, right? So maybe leads to oscillations, you might think, okay? Uh, and that's related to both this cyclotron frequency, i.e. the magnetic field strength, but also how much repulsion you're getting or anti-confinement you're getting from the potential. So this equation doesn't look trivial to solve, but actually is one that does have uh, solutions, okay? And the primary feature of it is that you get uh, motion uh, uh, or the solutions have two frequency components and the two frequency components are at this uh, frequency, the cyclotron frequency, which is what you would get if you just had a particle in a magnetic field, plus minus this uh, component, which is due to both the uh, magnetic field and due to the uh, anti-confinement of the trap. And I'll come back to where that's coming from uh, in a moment. So um, what do we see here? We see that the parameters do have to uh, satisfy this equation in order for delta to be a real quantity, if you like, right? Then we have to have the cyclotron frequency high enough compared to this anti-confinement. And that's some a condition that sets the operating parameters for a penning trap. Okay, so um, what are the motions? Uh, what we're looking for then is that there are two types of motion appearing at uh, these two distinct frequencies. And so we could plot trajectories uh, in the 2D space as a function of time. And what you would see, at least in the case where uh, omega plus is much greater than omega minus, you would see something uh, like this, where the uh, magnetic field is coming out of the plane here. And there are two types of rotational motion uh, going on, right? So you can imagine the particle uh, following uh, this trajectory, right? Uh, and the two characteristic frequency components here, they lead to two types of motion. One which is uh, shifted from the bare cyclotron frequency. So if you were just in a magnetic field, you would have a circular component from a cyclotron frequency if you had no potential present. And now what you see is that the frequency of that type of motion is modified. It's, take, it's now a cyclotron frequency shifted by some certain amount, right? There's a plus here, but you'll see that that plus doesn't quite give a uh, cyclotron frequency, but is adjusted by the presence of the potential, right? So uh, you get these uh, fast loops, that's this modified cyclotron frequency, and accompanying that you get uh, what many people would call a drift motion, or a magnetron motion, which is a, a slower frequency. So it's omega C minus this delta parameter, uh, which then is somehow like a, a drift of this uh, circular motion keeps drifting round and round in, in space at a much lower rate. 
Yeah. Uh, and so these are the two characteristic motions in uh, penning trap. And they have some uh, reasonably interesting uh, features. So the modified cyclotron is actually less interesting in a certain sense. I mean, it, it's useful, but less interesting. It's just a harmonic oscillator, okay? Uh, and it's if you quantize that, it has energy levels, which are just separated by uh, omega plus, essentially, right? The magnetron is actually a more interesting kettle of fish uh, because it's an inverted harmonic oscillator. That's a weird thing, right? Uh, so what does this mean? This means that as you go to higher energy levels uh, or as you go to lower energies of the magnetron motion, you have uh, larger orbits and it's higher excitations of the magnetron motion, right? So this has weird consequences, right? This means that if you want to um, get the magnetron to be in its lowest entropy state, the easiest way to do that is usually what you would do in a normal oscillator is you would cool to the ground state, right? And for the magnetron motion, you have to uh, uh, put energy into the system in order to drive it down to its uh, ground state, essentially, which its ground state is now the highest energy state. The magnetron motion is also inherently energetically unstable, yeah, in the sense that if I sit in this lowest, uh, in the smallest, most confined uh, state of the magnetron motion, I, in principle, have the possibility to go to the n equal one state and the n equal two and get, in a sense, hotter and hotter and hotter and develop a thermal uh, population which is inverted and in fact eventually you would expect the particle to lose uh, leave the trap right so energetically the magnetron motion doesn't seem confined but what you have to remember is that the angular momentum in this system has to be conserved and it's the conservation of angular momentum that prevents the magnetron from naturally uh, le leaking down this ladder of states right so in order to go down this ladder, angular momentum has to change, essentially. That said, there can be dissipative processes. And if you have dissipation that's sucking energy out of the system, that can produce this sort of behavior where you essentially, uh, in an inverted way, heat up the magnetron and eventually lose it from the trap. So um, then you have to think, uh, what are the consequences? So it's, it's quasi-stable, essentially, due to conservation of angular momentum. Uh, and you have to worry about whether you lose these particles, right? But actually what you see is that even for an electron and that I think this loss goes as one over the mass cubed, usually it's coming from uh, essentially radiation due to the fact you've got an accelerating charge, right? And it's already a years long time scale for an electron and it's then, uh, yeah, I don't know how many years for a heavier particle like a, a, a trapped iron atom weight, you know? So it's 1,800 times heavier and this thing goes as one of a mass cube. So it's a, it's a very dramatic suppression. So in, in practice then, these magnetron motions are, are well confined, yeah? Uh, and what we have to deal with in this inverted harmonic oscillator is sometimes that uh, things like laser cooling become non-trivial things to do. Yeah. So, um, yeah, here's then I want to go to, into the quantum motion in, in a penning trap. And here now, I don't know why I wrote cylindrical coordinates. Ah, oh, yes, indeed. I will treat it in cylindrical coordinates still, right? So we can think about what the Hamiltonian looks like uh, for this thing. So here is again, uh, canonical momentum. Here it's now modified by the vector potential. This is sort of the standard Hamiltonian you'd expect to see if you were doing quantum optics and you were using the uh, optical electric field, you would have the uh, electromagnetic field you would have coming in here. Um, in the radial motion, and here I just restrict to the radial motion, then it's very then, it's kind of clear now where this uh, frequency component, this delta is coming from, right? So what's happened uh, in uh, the expansion of this Hamiltonian, at least in the Coulomb gauge, is that what you find is that there's this additional term coming from the magnetic field, which is quadratic in this radial coordinate, uh, but now has a confining form. It's a plus uh, R squared type term and it's proportional to the cyclotron frequency squared, right? So in that sense, what you have here in the radial coordinate, these are the radial terms, is a confining harmonic oscillator as long as omega C squared minus two omega Z squared is positive. But on top of that, you have a term which is proportional to this canonical angular momentum, right? And this is the additional magnetic field term. 
And if the angular momentum gets large, you can see that uh, these terms are always positive. So you've got uh, uh, essentially a, a confined oscillator, if you like, but you can start to have ne negative energy levels that's going to be associated with the magnetron motion. So you can actually solve this directly without worrying about cyclotron and magnetron motion being separated out in frequency and look for the energy eigenstates. There's simultaneously eigenstates of the Hamiltonian part, but also of the uh, angular momentum, right? Uh, and you see that there are two quantum numbers coming in, one which is the angular momentum quantum number, uh, and one is a radial quantum number. It tells you the number of the nodes in the wave function uh, in the radial coordinate, okay? So uh, essentially, uh, again, quantized uh, levels coming in here, uh, comprised of both an angular momentum component and a radial uh, component. So we can also do the same sort of thing in Cartesian coordinates and look at the Hamiltonian there. And it's sort of useful to do that. In fact, you'll see that the first two terms are pretty much identical. Uh, but what you see here is that what the uh, angular momentum term is doing essentially is coupling together the motion in two perpendicular directions, which are x and uh, y, right? Uh, and that's this uh, basically the magnetic field uh, contribution, the Lorentz force. Right? So uh, you can make a linear transformation. So just there's a new set of coordinates being introduced here, which are combinations of the uh, position uh, in one direction and the momentum in the uh, other direction. I suspect I should have spot y and uh, x uh, sitting here, if you like. Uh, and just to say that these, this is a position, here's a, a momentum. And what you see, if you like, if this coordinate is uh, maximized, let's say the Q plus, you would see that you would simultaneously somehow want to be maximizing both the position and the velocity in the Y direction. So it's somehow, you already see the structure of a circular type motion coming in here uh, in these canonical uh, transformations. So uh, in that case, then this writing just in terms of these uh, new coordinates, if you like, what you find is a sum of two harmonic oscillator terms. They've got the two frequencies that we mentioned before, the modified cyclotron frequency, the magnetron frequency. And the thing to notice is that this one is a harmonic oscillator, a positive harmonic oscillator, but there's a minus sign uh, in this term here. And that's exactly the inverted nature of the magnetron uh, oscillation. Okay? So the energy eigenstates then are energy eigenstates of both types of motion. So uh, with one type of energy, we get a quantum number for the uh, modified cyclotron motion. With another energy scale, right, which is set by the different frequency, we get the uh, other term n minus. And here we have the uh, and zero point motion essentially coming in. And in the angular momentum, it's just worth pointing out that the angular momentum uh, is also just given by the difference in the quantum numbers between the number of quanta in the uh, modified cyclotron motion and the number of quanta in the uh, magnetron motion. Okay, so uh, those are, that's kind of the basic uh, trapping in a penning trap. I think the main take home message is that you've got uh, these two oscillations uh, the, one of them is an inverted harmonic oscillator, that's the magnetron. Uh, and the, um, an important parameter there is this uh, delta parameter, which is the square root of the cyclotron frequency squared minus two times the, um, uh, minus two times the uh, uh, confining frequency squared. And just to notice that that's the thing that pops up in the zero point energy, right? So the cyclotron, uh, as itself does not contribute to the zero point energy, but only in combination with the anti-confinement. Okay, so now let me come to the first set of experiments that have been done uh, with uh, penning traps, if you like, or one of the key uh, early advent experiments that sort of were done. And that's uh, what we call G minus two experiments. And they're very famous. They've been done with a number of the sort of fundamental particles, but the most, I think probably the most fundamental in terms of when you directly look at it from a student perspective is that of the electron, right? So let me explain the G minus uh, two measurements of the electron. Uh, and what you know about the spin G factor of the electron is that it's two plus some amount. Uh, and this amount comes from quantum electrodynamics, right? That's probably you knew that it was 2.002 something, something, something. 
the Dirac theory, if you like, gives you the factor of two, and then quantum QED gives you the vacuum corrections give you uh, this additional factor. So what, how does that manifest itself? If you have a spin of an electron, then you've got a spin flip frequency, which is given by the G factor times the Bohr magneton times the magnetic field divided by H bar, right? Uh, and actually that's just this G times uh, half of what we know to be the cyclotron frequency. So in a magnetic field, uh, the bare cyclotron frequency, if you didn't have any potential present, uh, would be a cyclotron motion at this EB over M, uh, which is the natural circular moment, um, motion in a magnetic field. So what do you see of these two things? They're, they're highly related to each other, right? Uh, but they are slightly different, right? Uh, and uh, what this means is that uh, one can go plotting the structure of the energy levels in terms of both the spin and the cyclotron uh, motion. And that's uh, this is a very detailed diagram. I put, pulled it from a, um, a paper, if you like, but let me just explain it to you. Each of these columns uh, is uh, I, either the spin being minus a half or the spin being plus a half. So, uh, and on the left-hand side, I'm plotting the number of quanta in the cyclotron motion. So what you see is that uh, the difference between uh, these different energy levels is basically the cyclotron frequency, though it is slightly modified. And the modification comes from the fact that in a penning trap, uh, this modification, this VC bar, is the modified cyclotron frequency, not the cyclotron frequency. Yeah? So there's a slight complication uh, coming there already. Uh, the difference between n equal to 0 and n equal to 0 uh, but with the spin flipped is ever so slightly different to that, right? Because it's got this extra factor uh, related to the difference uh, in the G factor essentially, right? So uh, what do we see? When we take the difference of the spin and cyclotron frequencies and divide it by the bare cyclotron frequency, we see that it gives you the difference between the G factor of the electron uh, and two, which is exactly what you want to know about quantum electrodynamics, uh, yeah? And uh, this ratio is a factor which is independent of the magnetic field because all of these parameters are proportional to the magnetic field. So the field itself drops out. Uh, and if you can measure this ratio, then you can measure QED independent of what the uh, magnetic field you use is. So this is good because all you have to do here is measure frequencies. Uh, and frequency ratios are probably the best determined things that we have in physics. So the classic example would be atomic clocks today, where you compare the uh, essentially a transition frequency in, say, aluminum to uh, aluminum ion to a ytterbium atom. Uh, and these are known to sort of 18 or 17 decimal places or so, right? These are really remarkable uh, measurements. Yeah. In these cases here, there's a has to be a measurement of this bare cyclotron frequency and the spin flip frequency. Uh, and these measurements are made at the level of 10 to the minus 12 or so, but still that it's a remarkable precision you can make uh, in terms of the accuracy. Yeah. So um, this is the starting point. Um, so what do the experiments look like? So magnetic fields, and this is something that's common to all penning trap experiments, is that they're at large magnetic fields, right? Uh, and these are the sort of magnetic fields, several Tesla, where you need a, usually a superconducting magnet. Um, and uh, especially for stability, those are very useful things to use. But what you find at that point is that both these spin and cyclotron frequencies for an electron, right, will be around 150 uh, gigahertz. And then the, the nice thing about 150 gigahertz is, if you like, that if you just cool the system down to about 100 millikelvin, you will find that your system is close to the quantum ground state for this, these types of motion. So with the spin and cyclotron motion, if they come into thermal equilibrium, you'll find they're in the ground state. Yeah. And then there will be some mechanisms by which excitations do get in, uh, but you can find about what the lifetime of these uh, states will be. Uh, and for the cyclotron motion, the lifetime of states is several seconds. Uh, for the spin, uh, it's two years or so, right? So these are systems which uh, quantum mechanical states live for a long time. Yeah. And just to show you measurements of that, so I'll come back to how this is measured. It's about jumps in the axial frequency, actually. Uh, but what the, the cool thing is, is the way these measurements are made, uh, they are set up so that uh, if the spin changes uh, its orientation or if the cyclotron motion changes, 
you will see an, a change in the axial frequency, which is sort of the measurement parameter. And it's a quantum non-demolition measurement. So you can in situ, if you like, watch quanta jump in and out of these types of motion. And here you're just seeing that sort of measurement. So there's over time of 15 seconds or so, um, the, here comes the uh, particle, it's in one of its spin states, and then suddenly it hops to another spin state and shifts the axial frequency, and that's what's observed. And here is a more uh, characteristic one that's getting you towards this four second time scale. So this is really a fundamental jump from the, I think from the ground to the excited state. And then uh, the excitation decays again after a few seconds uh, governed by this four second time scale. So how is that measurement made? I'm, I told you that it has to be made by looking at uh, axial motion. So the, the deal basically is that these electrons are read out by the currents that they induce in the surrounding uh, penning, the, in the trap uh, volume, yeah. And so if you were to see one of these traps, uh, it's, it's a gold structure. It's got uh, segments uh, along the magnetic field axis, which is vertical here. Uh, that produces the axial confinement, the radial anti-confinement in the static potentials. But in order to make measurements, what they do is they concentrate on the axial motion, which is at tens of megahertz, and that's much easier to see the currents because this motion is larger, essentially, in amplitude. Yeah. So what they use to make sure that the axial motion can see the radial motion, right, because we want to measure cyclotron frequencies and spin frequencies, is something called this magnetic bottle, yeah? What they do is create a magnetic field in homogeneity such that the magnetic field is reduced in this region uh, and uh, is higher in the uh, regions above. Yeah? And the potential that that gives you for a spin of magnetic moment mu uh, is not just now the confinement potential of the electrostatic potential, but also this potential if you've got a magnetic moment, uh, which is proportional to some uh, curvature of the magnetic field, uh, times the position squared, right? So there's now an additional frequency component to the trap that's coming purely from the magnetic uh, component of your um, electron. And the magnetic dipole moment can come either from the circular motion of this cyclotron motion, or it can come from the actual spin of the electron itself, right? So what can you think of? You can think of the fact that what this does is it means that uh, as you uh, change the number of quanta in the cyclotron motion or the spin, this is changing the trap frequency that's felt in the axial direction because it modifies uh, this term here, right? Uh, and so this is actually number of quanta in the other motion, in the radial motion, uh, but it's telling you about what the uh, frequency will be because the curvature of this potential changes uh, in the axial degree of freedom. So uh, with the results of that, that's basically the techniques that are used, okay? I won't then go into details of the measurement, but uh, these, uh, the measurements that can be made of this ratio are better than 10 to the minus 12. And actually, these are the best constraints on alpha, the fine structure constant that we have in physics today, uh, done in these penning traps. And I think it's even better than the theory that can be used to calculate. So the uncertainties at the moment in the theory that's used to sort of uh, estimate what alpha could be based on the measurements uh, is actually larger, I think, than the experimental uncertainties on this ratio. So it's quite a remarkable experiment. Yeah. And you could find more details in this paper from Jerry Gabriel's group. Okay, so now uh, that was all about electrons and electrons are kind of a, a charge, but then they uh, interact with the outside world, if you like, via currents in the, in the electrode structure, okay? But what I want to come back to now is into uh, laser cooling because most of the lectures you've seen were on laser cooled ions and that's important from the sort of quantum control uh, aspect. So the primary challenge, laser cooling otherwise in penning traps is fairly similar to in any other uh, uh, ion trap, so in a pole trap. But the main problem for cooling is this magnetron motion, which has got this weird feature of having a negative energy, right? It's this inverted harmonic oscillator. And the challenge is that uh, in standard Doppler cooling, right, what you do is you sit with a red detuned laser and you make it preferential, uh, you make a friction force essentially, which extracts uh, energy from the oscillator through the fact that the force is velocity dependent, right? Uh, and what you're doing then is extracting uh, kinetic energy. And what that will do for a magnetron uh, 
uh, motion is it will take you down this ladder of states, right? You go to essentially higher and higher n, and we would consider that as heating the magnetron motion. And somehow that's the opposite of what you want to do. What you want to do is to confine your particle extremely well if you want to use it. So um, just to point that out, then here's a laser spectrum. I, I showed you a laser spectrum uh, the other day uh, of an ion in a pull trap. Uh, and we saw motional sidebands on the spectrum, uh, as well as a carrier. Uh, and what you find here, this is actually a cold ion. So the deal is that it's nearly in the ground state of both the magnetron and cyclotron modes. Yeah? Uh, so here at the center is actually the carrier transition. And you see the normal uh, situation for the cyc modified cyclotron that there's a blue sideband, which is at a positive frequency. And there's a red sideband, which has basically disappeared because you're in the ground state, which is sitting at a negative frequency relative to the carrier. But the equivalent thing for the magnetron motion, which is a much lower frequency in this particular case, is that it sits on the opposite side of the carrier. This is the blue sideband, or it would have the antigens coming simultaneous, if you like. Uh, and this one here is the um, red, uh, sort of the equivalent of a red sideband that would, uh, if you like, be used to uh, cool down the motion. It would take you from n equal one to n equal zero if you flip the spin, right? So that it, everything is reversed because of this negative frequency for this magnetron type motion. So that means that standard Doppler cooling heats you up. So how can you get around this? Well, one of the ways to get around this is to take your laser beam uh, and offset it from the center of the trap. Yeah, And what that means is that uh, now, instead of using the velocity profile of the beam or of the interaction of the iron with the uh, laser light uh, as a function of velocity, if you like, that's what you use for Doppler cooling. An equivalent thing can be done if you have a, a, a profile in space, then you can make sure that the atom prefers to uh, interact with light when it's on uh, one side of its uh, trajectory. You can imagine it going, uh, say, round and round like this, than when it's on the other side of its trajectory, right? So in one case, it's got uh, one type of velocity. In the other case, it's got the opposite velocity, right? And again, this can create the same sort of bias you have in, in Doppler cooling towards absorbing uh, light when you uh, would reduce the amount of momentum in the motion rather than when you would increase it. And so this can be used also for uh, effectively Doppler cooling, this magnetron motion. And it mainly affects the magnetron motion because it's got the larger orbit typically, right? It's a lower frequency of motion. So the challenge with that is that uh, once you get close to cooling limits, to make this type of cooling effective, you need very small orbits, yeah? And what that means is that you actually need uh, quite strong gradients. You need tightly focused laser beams, right? So this is uh, challenging because of the need for tight focusing to get cold. And then you have to position a tightly focused laser beam versus your center of your trap very well. So the other way to do it is actually to uh, use a, an additional electric field, which oscillates, right? Uh, which uh, is applied at exactly the cyclotron frequency. So this now is not the modified cyclotron frequency, it's not the frequency of the mode, but it's rather the bare cyclotron uh, frequency. And what that does, it's got a quadrupole shape, which has got a different symmetry to what we had originally. So remember the anti-confinement we had previously was uh, a minus m times r squared sort of term. So it was symmetric between x and y. And this term now breaks that symmetry. And what that means is it actually can couple the magnetron and cyclotron modes. And if it has the cyclotron frequency itself, it sits at the sum then of both of the frequencies of these bare modes. So it's at the sum basically of the frequency of the magnetron to the frequency of the uh, cyclotron motion. Uh, and so you get resonant behaviors which can trade quanta between these two types of motion. Uh, and uh, what's that going to do? It's going to create uh, hybridized states, if you like, which are uh, superpositions or energy eigenstates, if you like, which are superpositions of magnetron and cyclotron motion. Yeah. And then that leads to essentially thermalization between the two types of motion. So uh, just to say that um, they trade energy, right? Uh, and here's some plots, if you like, of simulated Doppler cooling uh, performed by my student, Shay and Jane. Uh, as a function of uh, cooling time. Uh, and then uh, what you see essentially is that the magnetron here is roughly speaking tracking the cyclotron uh, 
uh, motion in its number of quanta, yeah? And so they come essentially into thermal equilibrium. And so by cooling, essentially laser cooling the cyclotron motion, one also ends up uh, cooling the magnetron motion. So at that point, that's probably a good point to have any questions. Does anyone have any questions? For me? Um, I don't see on the chat, but maybe um, I have a question, right? So the yeah. so this reminds me like um, the, the this is like really coupling the axial to the magnetron or cyclotron motions, right? Yeah. Which you could do uh, by... Yeah, but, sorry, in this case, I'm coupling the... Um, the two radial motions together. You could also do it by coupling it to the axial motion. Yeah, so right. right. In the, yeah, in, in, in some of these experiments, you, I mean, we used to cut the, the radial, radially the, uh, the electrode and then apply RF to, to couple this. Yeah, yeah. yeah. Um, I, I would imagine this is doing the same, but now you have the laser to do it. So um, now, which means the thermal equilibrium of the system is, um, so all the modes would be at the same temperature, if I, I call it. That's roughly true, yeah. So I think it depends a bit on how strong this coupling is versus the laser damping frequency, right? Right. Uh, but essentially, you don't want this to be uh, too strong, but uh, you want it to be strong enough that it provides some mixing. And, and in, in the case that it does, then roughly these things come into thermal equilibrium in the sense that they have the same number of quanta yeah right but then if you want to do let's say the cyclotron to be a modified cyclotron to be in the ground state for your processing mm -hmm. i don't know what you want to do but then would it be a problem because now you you kind of traded off the temperature to be higher yeah that's that's probably true um i think what you would say is that you can the axialization field can be turned on and off uh, because it's an rf drive essentially uh, so you would, if you wanted to work, uh, you probably want your modes to be close to the Doppler temperature, right? So at that point you turn this on during Doppler cooling, but then you turn it off and you proceed with sideband cooling uh, without the axialization. Oh, I see, I see. And at that point you see, if I look at this uh, diagram here, at that point then what do you have to do to do sideband cooling? You have to go and find the red sideband of the cyclotron motion, but then you probably for the next cycle, go and select out the frequency of the blues, blues, if you like, the positive component of the magnetron, because that's what's going to cool the magnetron. So sideband cooling is resonance selective, and you would jump from one to the other. Uh, but Doppler cooling cannot be resonance selective. With Doppler cooling, you kind of plunk your laser on the red side, and it couples to the entire red side a bit stronger than it couples to the blue side, is usually what you're using. Yeah. Um, I see. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I get it. Yeah. Thanks, thanks. Good. Are there any other questions? Then this is a good time, maybe. Can I ask a very yeah, general please, please. question? Yes. So you are dealing with two-dimensional harmonic oscillators, uh, and they are coupled oscillators. Am I right? If if so, uh, you have shown that uh, they can be described in uh, terms of uh, Cartesian coordinates and uh, radial and uh, cylindrical coordinates. Mm -hmm. Can you also describe them in terms of uh, Lagrange polynomials? Yeah, I could maybe just, yeah, so maybe I just go back a bit. So the, um, of course, once I'm writing down this Hamiltonian, I've gone to a set of coordinates which is uncoupled again, right? So the magnetron and modified cyclotron are uncoupled mm -hmm. uh, coordinate sets, yeah? So indeed, X and Y are coupled, but you can choose a parameter set that produces normal modes and are separable, yeah? So when you said Laguerre polynomials, one thing to note about um, the solutions to this Hamiltonian, right, uh, is that you have a product, I didn't write it down, the wave function, but you have a product of something that just looks like e to the i m phi, which is the usual angular momentum wave functions that you know from hydrogen, if you like. Uh, and then these guys here, the solution to this equation is some exponential factor, but includes a Laguerre polynomial in R, yeah? Um, and um, so that was when you said Laguerre polynomials, it triggered that thought that uh, the lowest energy state, actually, you can kind of see it if, if the or lowest angular momentum, if this was zero and this was zero, it's very straightforwardly a two dimensional harmonic oscillator, right? So you would just get a Gaussian. But once the angular momentum increases in its quantum number, you start to, and for higher excited states, it's a two dimensional 
uh, problem, you start to then get these Laguerre polynomials appearing for the uh, eigenfunctions. Yeah. So I hope that was sort of what you're asking. I think you're probably on the right track. Is that okay? Um, yes, yes, okay, thank you. Thank you. Okay, let's move on then. Good, okay. So I probably stopped a little bit late, but uh, yeah, okay, good. Uh, da, 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 da. Good, so um, I just want to show group results from the imperial group. So they've sort of been, I think, al along with John Bollinger's group, they've been at NIST, they've been working on uh, sideband cooling. I think the imperial guys, they laser cooled all the radial modes to the ground state, which was sort of a new step for them uh, a few years ago. So I wanted to share with you uh, some of those results, if you like. I got them from Pavel Hermo, who was a PhD student there and uh, will be arriving with me for a postdoc soon. So this is the result of Doppler cooling. Yeah, and what they used there was both an offset beam, which I've described with this intensity gradient, and also some axialization, which is the potential that I just described. So uh, what you see, I mean, the, the frequencies of oscillation here are uh, by ion trapping standards lowish, right? So typically people are working with more than a megahertz of trap frequency. And here you see a magnetron motion, which is at 50 kilohertz. Yeah? And the difference between those two means that the sideband structure is actually rather complicated, okay? Uh, so here is the sort of set of transitions um, close to the carrier, yeah? Is the first sideband of the cyclotron motion and each of them are somehow decorated with a number of resonances, and that's the, uh, all the different sidebands of the magnetron motion, which is very low frequency. So still what's happened here is that though you're thermalized, the, the temperature of these ions is reasonably uh, high, okay? And so you're uh, all still seeing, if you like, plenty of sidebands. You're not fully in the lambda regime. You're seeing plenty of sidebands and a similar sort of profile of the sidebands for the cyclotron motion to the uh, magnetron motion here, yeah? So anyway, this is the result of Doppler cooling. And what this means if you're outside the Lambdicki regime uh, is that you have to work a little bit harder at the sideband cooling, but nevertheless, and this is the spectrum I showed you earlier, they were able with many cycles of sideband cooling uh, to bring themselves down to the quantum ground state of both of these motions, if you like. Uh, and um, the, a key feature, I think, at least at the level of this lecture, is the fact that these sidebands are reversed and that the ratio of the sidebands, you probably heard from DD Library, gives you the temperature, and you'll see it's about a half there, and there's probably some other limit there. Well, they give the temperatures, so they get down into the ground state for both types of motion. So um, that shows, if you like, that uh, Doppler cooling is uh, possible for these sort of uh, uh, systems. And the main challenge there, I think, is. Uh, that sort of remains in a certain sense from those experiments is just the very low trap frequencies they're working at. That sort of further complicates the cooling. Okay, from there then let me talk a little bit about uh, John Bollinger's experiments. Um, so uh, here I want to tell you a little bit about 2D physics in ion traps. So as I said, you probably heard a little bit from Christian Roos about how they try and make uh, 2D crystals uh, in pole traps and the challenge there is to deal with the radio frequency driven motion that we call micromotion. Yeah. So uh, in penning traps, then uh, these beautiful 2D lattices have been uh, produced and that produces a natural two dimensional lattice for doing uh, quantum simulation type experiments. And I'll tell you about that uh, in the sort of following slides, if you like. Uh, the other aspect where people try to go towards 2D physics in ion traps is actually in microfabricated fa radio frequency traps, uh, where there's people working on that in a number of different groups. And the key there is not to try and go to a regime where you have ions sitting where there's a larger RF field, but rather provide a quadrupole potential, a static quadrupole potential for each ion individually, but also uh, have an individual radio frequency potential for each ion individual, uh, which is a confining uh, or an oscillating quadrupole, right? So what does this mean? It means making microscopic potentials for each and every ion. And then in order to make ions interact, they have a Coulomb interaction, you basically have to get them close enough together. So in order to do this sort of thing, what you really have, what's opened up this possibility is the possibility to fabricate microfabricated chips with length structures that uh, are where this distance 
is small enough that people might be, that the repulsion between the two ions can produce significant normal mode splitting, which allows you to do the sort of quantum control that we do in ion traps today. Okay, so uh, this people are working on now, there are people with sort of three sites, if you like, and they think how to scale this up. Uh, it's got some challenges. One is that it requires small traps. So in fact, in order to get things tightly packed, you typically have to bring them close to the surfaces, which is where you get more noise uh, for the motion uh, coming from heating. Uh, and it requires for the RF traps, high voltage RF signals applied to these traps, which is a source of heat dissipation, okay? So I'll return to this, a future project, the thing that we're working on on penning traps is actually in this direction to do it with, uh, without the high voltage radio frequency, yeah? But first, let me tell you a little bit about these beautiful experiments from John Bollinger's group, NIST. So uh, here's a picture of the electrodes of uh, the NIST trap. So what you see along the magnetic field, that's where you need the confinement, is several electrodes. So uh, these electrodes can be biased such to produce a potential well along that axis and to repel ions in the radial dimension. Uh, you see also the central electrode is split up, and I'll tell you why that is in, in just a second. And this structure is about two centimeters in its uh, diameter, yeah? And the crystals that you'll see are much smaller than that. That's not quite to scale, but it can go up to being millimeter scale uh, crystals of atoms. So this is what it really looks like in life, right? It's got these gold electrodes, which are held by make or uh, spacers. You can see various capped on wires, and it has to be placed inside a, a superconducting magnet. So there's this four and a half Tesla uh, solenoid that he has in his lab. So uh, what's the sort of frequencies that John Bollinger works with? He has this four and a half Tesla magnet for beryllium ions, okay? So his cyclotron frequency is uh, eight megahertz or so. His axial frequency is about one and a half megahertz and his magnetron frequency, again, by ion trap standards, that's pretty low is around 160 uh, kilohertz. But what he's doing is working with large crystals uh, of ions, right? And crystals provide a balance between their confining potential and the Coulomb interaction, right? That's how the crystal forms in that sense. It's a naturally forming crystal. But one of the things you have as a tool there is that if this ion crystal is, uh, or these set of ions are spinning around at a certain velocity, then in the magnetic field that produces a different amount of radial confinement. Yeah? So if the angular momentum is uh, larger, what does that mean? That means there's more uh, outward uh, pressure, if you like, uh, and what that can cause is that at large rotation frequencies, if you like, or at a range of rotation frequencies of the crystals, you get different shapes of ion configurations, which are stable, yeah? So at the two extremes, so as you go towards the cyclotron frequency, or if, you if the crystal comes down towards the magnetron frequency, you get, uh, you can imagine that all of these blobs are drawn as if the magnetic field is pointing uh, upwards, yeah? So you get uh, them uh, radial uh, planar crystals, but as you go to this cyclotron frequency over two, then you get uh, a situation where the crystal is much more confined on the axis and you get, if you like, a, a, a pencil type crystal along the axis, okay? So two cases John has used, one uh, where they uh, have the system rotating uh, at close to the magnetron frequency where they get single planes of ions. And I'll show you a bit more of that in a second, how they do that. Uh, here is a top view of the ions and you see this nice uh, lattice, right, structure. Here's a side view and you see that it's a flat uh, lattice. It's a two dimensional uh, structure. Uh, they've also worked in the past with systems which are in an intermediate regime where they form um, three dimensional crystals, right? Uh, so these are body centered cubic crystals uh, uh, with sort of numbers of ions on the sort of 100,000. Uh, where they were able to observe this through fluorescence and through Bragg scattering. Yeah. So one of the challenges there is that in a symmetric penning trap, you don't have control over what the rotation frequencies of these ions are. Remember I said angular momentum is basically there conserved, right? And so the challenge in working like that is that you might be wanting to work in a regime where you have a 2D crystal, but gradually your ions will get faster and faster through some imperfection in your system, Um, Jonathan, maybe your 
Can you hear me? Hello, can you hear me, Jonathan? In phase with each other. Ah. Uh, can you still hear me? Uh, you were sometime not audible. Something happened at your place. Yeah, my laptop decided to change the speakers and the microphone. I hope you can hear me again. Yeah. Uh, yeah, yeah. Well, now we can hear you. Yeah. So, okay. so let's do that. Yeah. So you see that these opposing pairs here essentially are in phase, but there's a phase difference but at 90 degrees between the different uh, pairs. Yeah. So what that does is it slightly uh, contorts the crystal. It makes it non-circular uh, anymore, right? It provides a definite axis. And then this uh, frequency is uh, oscillating. So these basically this leads to a rotation of a preferred axis uh, as, a, as a torque, right? Which spins the crystal around. And the rotation you get is basically the same rotation of this drive frequency here. So let me just show you a, a picture of that. So um, in their trap, then they can view the ions from the side, right? And this is a side view. So what you see here, you can see probably shells of ions here. Uh, this is then a three-dimensional crystal. And then the system gets uh, spun up by the axialization and a movie should start now. And what you see is that as it gets spun up to the right uh, frequency, then the crystal goes through to, from three to two to one layers, if you like, and becomes a planar crystal, at which point, looking at the top, you see the nice structures that you saw before of these two-dimensional planar uh, crystals. Yeah. So some of you might notice that there are places here where there are holes yeah, in the filling. Yeah? There's two possible reasons for this. Uh, one is that atoms, of course, have atomic structure. So uh, atoms can get into electronic states where they don't fluoresce anymore. Uh, that's probably not the case here. I think the bigger challenge that these guys sometimes have is slightly imperfect vacuum. And what that leads is sometimes that uh, beryllium collides with hydrogen uh, and forms beryllium hydride atoms. And often what that will do is that these hydride atoms, these molecules essentially, uh, because they're slightly heavier, they will move to the outside of the crystal. And indeed, you see more of these holes occurring on the outside than you see occurring in the middle of the crystal. Yeah. So that's an additional detail. But this basically spinning at, exact, at the right sort of chosen frequency chooses your angular momentum that you have for your ions, chooses then the radial confinement and allows you to then uh, produce a, uh, the right properties of asymmetry between radial and axial to enable you to form these planar crystals. So what is the uh, scale of this um, crystal? So how large is this? Yeah, the, I had it in another picture, but I don't know, maybe it comes next. I think it's about, uh, like typically these are sort of on the several hundred micron level. So actually I thought I had, uh, yeah. So the I think the scale length that I do know uh, comes from these things is that this distance between the atoms is sort of between 15 and 20 microns, if you like. Uh, and so, yeah, here you see it. There's a sort of yeah. micron uh, crystal. Yeah. So the, the laser beam, I believe it's a Gaussian beam and um, we, we see this distribution of the fluorescence rate. Is it related to the laser beam profile or? Uh, that's a good question. I guess in this case, you see it at the edge, right? And I wouldn't know, I guess uh, here it looks fairly homogeneous. So I think the laser beam must be quite large. In the other one, the second one. Yeah, in this other case here, um, yeah. No, even even the third one, which you just showed now. Where the uh, next okay, this one here, you mean? Yeah. Uh, one more. Um, yeah. This? Yeah, yeah, here. Yeah, yeah they're slight, I agree with you. They're slightly more intense in the center. Yeah, I wouldn't like to predict that that was the laser okay. beam, but I could guess that that was the case, right? I mean, that's, yeah, yeah. Um, yeah. Yeah, I mean, you do in large crystals in pole traps, you have a different reason for getting that sort of profile, which is that the sure. Doppler forces are changing with position. But I think in this case, the plane is not oscillating dramatically differently at the sides to in the center. Right. Uh, so I think it should be much more about the laser beam profile. Yeah. Okay, sorry. Yeah, please go ahead. Yeah, that's good. Yeah. So Saurav says volume is gone. Ah, volume is gone on my speaker. Yeah, good. Thanks for interrupting and uh, correcting. No, no, now it's fine. Now it's okay. Yeah, good. Okay. 
Okay, so I think, and this is probably one of the reasons, uh, there's two reasons probably why people working in quantum information in uh, trapped ions don't naturally work with um, penning traps, right? One of them you've already seen is the complications of cooling the magnetron motion, but the other is actually atomic structure, right? Uh, one thing that happens at high magnetic fields like several Tesla, it's that your splittings are very large, yeah? And so you need to have, uh, beryllium is actually quite convenient in that sense. It doesn't require so many different lasers, right? Uh, but if you want to manipulate spin states or qubit states in beryllium, you need to bridge this 124 gigahertz splitting. That's a high and bit painful frequency, uh, both for microwaves, but actually much more so for lasers. Yeah, Because what it requires to do things like Raman transitions is that you've got high frequency modulators that can bridge such frequency gaps. And those AOMs will not do that. Uh, so typically what you require is multiple laser systems, phase locks between them, et cetera, et cetera. And in the more, in the heavier ions with slightly different structure, this actually just requires lots more lasers. Yeah. So in a certain sense, then that's probably one of the challenges. And that, these are the two challenges that led people towards pull traps in terms of simplicity. Yeah. So nevertheless, a uh, beautiful experience has been done. So let me just uh, mention some of those. So um, the next thing I want to tell you about then in these experiments is the sort of con uh, control of interactions between spins uh, in these experiments. And you've seen the physics of that already if you attended uh, a little bit in my talk on motional states, but also Christian Roos's uh, talks. Yeah? So what you have here is uh, essentially a, a standing or a traveling standing wave potential. So there's a laser beam Here's the plane of the ion crystals, if you like. There's a laser beam that comes towards that plane and a laser beam that comes out of that, slightly out of that plane. And those have a difference frequency, which I'll denote by nu. Ah, mu, sorry, yeah. So just to give you a, a scale, right, the, the wavelength of this uh, standing wave, which moves across the ions at this point is then about a, a micro. So this leads to a term, which is this state dependent force I told you about the other day, right? There's some sort of modulation frequency, but otherwise on any particular spin, there's a, a spin operator, which is coupled to the axial position of that uh, ion, right? So that's the coupling that gets used. And as you saw, I hope in Christian's uh, talk, then uh, you can derive an effective Hamiltonian for this sort of dynamics uh, in certain limits. So uh, where, uh, you get an additional term. You get one term which couples the spin to the motion. But if you uh, go to detunings that are sufficient that these don't play a role or you pick certain times, then you're left behind with essentially what looks like an interaction term between the spins, an effective interaction via the motional uh, modes. And the interesting thing about these is that the interaction uh, parameters between any two spins in your array can be chosen experimentally, right? So the range of the interactions, the form of this J uh, matrix uh, can be chosen to have different dependencies on the difference in the distance between the ions in the, in the array. And so the, that dependence is characterized by a power law factor, right? Uh, and the key parameter that sets this power law is how far, uh, if you have a, a common mode of motion at one end of the uh, set of modes that you're using, how far detuned you are out from that common mode tells you what this power will be. Yeah? So typically what happens is that as you go to larger and larger detunings here, you get uh, A increasing. Uh, when the detuning only couples to the common mode of motion, that's homogeneous over all of the ions, you get long range couplings between equally between all of the ions. So all of the spins couple to each other. But as you start to detune further and further, you go towards a limit which is dipole-dipole type structure, one over, uh, or A is equal to three, if you like, so uh, one over R cubed. Yeah. Uh, and indeed, that's the structure that they've uh, mapped out in this system, if you like. So the, here are plotted the experimental uh, detunings that are used, and here are the, uh, the JIJ matrix as a function of the separation, if you like. And you see, I think these are probably calculations, actually, you see the different uh, values of this um, power law. Yeah, so this is long range interactions, all to all coupling. Uh, this is uh, got shorter range dipole dipole, and this is still considered long range in a certain sense. So one of the nice experiments that they did there was to look at spin squeezing, which maybe you saw in Vlad Angulicic's talks also, right? So uh, in a sense, these were used as a benchmark for control of these long range uh, interactions. 
And the basic notion is that uh, the, the unitary transformation under this interaction set has a term which is proportional to the spin. Uh, this is now the total spin of all of the atoms, but here you can think of it as being the sum of the spin terms of all the individual atoms, okay? And then there's this interaction term, which actually just looks like the total spin squared. So what I'm plotting here is sort of block vectors for this large spin vector made up of a sum of all the individual spins, right? And if I just have a, 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 a standard uh, quantum system, if you like, that I prepared in one state and then rotated uh, with a pi by two pulse, I get this sort of coherent state type structure on the, on the block sphere, right? It's got equal, quadrature amplitude uh, uncertainty in both directions. But this term here, what does it lead to? It leads to, if you're in a plus eigenstate of SZ, then this SZ squared adds to that state, right? Adds extra energy and you will get faster precession of the state. Whereas if this term is minus, right? Then what you will see is that the S squared is still positive and you'll see that the precession is now uh, slower, if you like, and, and would be expected to be from here in the opposite direction, but then is uh, slightly accelerated, right? So what do you see? You see a shearing effect on the uh, block vector distribution, right? States that are higher in the total spin, they get moved ahead of states that are um, uh, lower in the total spin that are negative, right? And what this does is it stretches out this block vector such that you get uh, in one direction, you get higher uncertainty in the other direction, you get reduced uncertainty, and that squeezes the states of the spins below the standard quantum limit. Uh, so what can you then do? You can then anal analyze what this distribution looks like. And here, what they're doing is they're changing the angle of essentially how they view the spins. And you can see uh, here they're putting the variance of the spin vector, which is basically the width of this distribution. And you can see that it goes down for some angles before increasing for other angles. And that's the fact that this thing is an oval now. Yeah. And then they also use this to show that they could do uh, sensing at some level uh, or how this is a function of the amount of time they apply the Hamiltonian for. Uh, and what you see is that the uh, variance of this squeezed variance gets reduced to down towards 10 dB reduction in the variance, if you like. Uh, and then at some point, the interactions on for long enough that errors start to dominate and the squeezing isn't good anymore. The other factor that happens here actually is that this thing gets so squeezed that the block vector distribution wraps around the whole distribution and you start to get all sorts of interference fringes on the back side. So uh, more, more is going on, but these are the basic signatures of spin squeezing in the system. Okay, finally, I think I have a little time left. Um, maybe there I just invite any more questions because I'll move to a slightly different topic at this point. Yeah. Um, in the chat box, there is nothing, right? Um, okay. in, I'm free to go. Or anyone wants to stick their hand? Uh, yeah. <laughs> so, um, in in terms of the spin squeezing, right? So, mm -hmm. um, there are other systems where spin squeezing is easier, right, compared to here. Um, oh, I, like, yeah. I don't know about easier. I think there are certainly in some of the ensembles now they've probably achieved higher levels of squeezing. Yeah. Right, right. Okay. So, so how would I mean? How, what makes it different in in, in, in doing it in penning traps? Uh, what makes it different? I guess the um, in some of those systems, then, like one of the things that you could see about a penning trap, if you like, is that from the pictures of the ions, then these ions are individually recognizable, right? So, in a certain sense, the longer perspective is taking advantage of the usual advantages of dealing with ions that. Uh, detection can be done very well, and you can see each and every ion typically, right? Uh, so in that sense, then I think this, as I said it here, was somehow a benchmark for how good the interactions were. But in a certain sense, it's also the starting point for doing uh, examinations of other spin models. But this was sort of the most natural one to examine uh, to see how well things are working. And of course, what you want to usually start off with with quantum systems is uh, sets of interactions where you produce states which are easy to characterize. And of course, squeeze states are somewhat easy to characterize compared to some complicated many body states. So the signatures are clearer uh, and it's a good benchmark usually for those sort of systems. That's right, that's right. Uh, there's one question here. Yeah. 
um, when you describe the inverted harmonic oscillator system, this is from Noah. Mm -hmm. um, is this type of system that is sometimes described using the analogy of a negative temperature since entropy decreases with increasing energy? Is this analogy useful? Yeah, I have to think about that. I mean, uh, certainly, I mean, your statement that the entropy is increase, uh, decreasing with increasing energy uh, would be, um, yeah, I mean, what would I say about that? So, of course, if you're in a single eigenstate, then your entropy doesn't change, right? So it's about its distributions uh, of states, which would contribute to some sort of uh, increase in entropy. And I think what I would be saying about the magnetron is that somehow if you want to produce a, usually when we try and produce a, a, a state which has got zero entropy or is a pure state, the easiest thing to do is to kind of drive to one end, drive dissipatively towards one particular state where the dynamics turns off. And usually the easiest one to pick is the ground state of your motion. You cool and cool and cool, and then there's a natural uh, point below which there is no energy. And in the magnetron motion, that'll happen when you've driven it to the higher, highest energy, actually. Yeah. So um, now, is there an inverted temperature? I, I think I always just think of it, what would be the distribution of states. And indeed, if you had what I might call a, homo, a, you know, a thermal state for a harmonic oscillator, which would have a larger occupation of n equal to 0, smaller of n equal 1, then you would look like the, um, that you had a larger population of a higher energy state. But you kind of have to think also that the Hamiltonian has a reversal in the sign for the magnetron motion. So that's where I wouldn't be too confident in answering your question and saying, yes, this has negative temperature. Yeah. Uh, so that's me being less comfortable with that concept without reading about it a bit to check out that I agree with the point. Yeah, that's, yeah. Hey, there is one more question. Um, can you tell a bit more about why beryllium is easier than maybe calcium in the NIST experiment? <laughs> yeah, okay, I can do that. So um, laser cooling, um, well, what Doppler cooling, oh, sorry, I'm trying to find the atomic structure. Uh, what Doppler cooling does, right, is what you want to do is you want to have, um, you want to scatter many photons, right? And so one nice feature of, uh, here's beryllium, right? And one nice feature of beryllium is that if you start in the spin uh, one half ground state and you excite into the uh, MJ spin plus three half state, the only place that you can possibly decay to in that atom is back to the same state that you started with. And so you need really one laser to do laser cooling. Yeah. And that's good uh, in this, and that's just based on selection rules. That, and this is good in these circumstances because um, the having uh, another laser that repumps you out of another level means having uh, a set, really a separate laser because the, the splittings here are so large. Yeah. Now in calcium, uh, what I try and remind you that we had was low lying D states. So these were D five halves or D three halves, and they had a lot of Zeeman substructure. Yeah, And in fact, they had larger orb, uh, total angular momentum than the P three halves here. Yeah. So what that means is that you can't anymore use a selection rule that will just decay into one state uh, in the ground state, but also you can't even tell it to just decay into one of the D states. Uh, you have to occupy several. And so what you'll need inevitably to do the cooling is multiple um, uh, lasers to do repumping. So you just need many laser systems. Now, the I think the thing that's starting to look promising about that, and this may be why penning traps becomes more interesting again, is that uh, now you can buy uh, electro-optic modulators, which do tens of gigahertz uh, uh, of bandwidth, right? Because you can buy these, well, you can buy them at 1550 for certain, but you can get them actually also in optical domain. So in that sense, then um, it suddenly starts to become possible in the laser domain to start to think to build systems that can repump uh, calcium. Whereas I think 10 years ago, I would have been a bit doubtful you could do that, but uh, now maybe you don't need uh, tens of lasers just to do the repumping because the modulator has got better. Yeah. Uh, and so I think at that point, then penning traps become a more feasible prospect again. Also, if you want to, there are, uh, you know, 
decent ways now to do um, phase locking at high frequencies. You know, you can get uh, photodiodes with bandwidths of tens of gigahertz now. And again, this just opens up these possibilities that maybe weren't available before. Does that, did that answer your question as well as go beyond it? Yeah. Um, I guess that uh, was fine with Nishant. Yeah, so there is a uh, thanks. So maybe we can go ahead. Yeah, great. Okay, so let me just come to quantum computing. So I, my primary domain has been quantum computing in pull traps, right? Uh, and I just want to tell you about the, some of the challenges that limit the scaling. And, and one of the things we have to think of there is that the we have beautiful quantum systems and sort of which maybe can go to 100 uh, ions or so. Uh, and you've seen in the penning trap a bit more on that from the ability to go into 2D, right? Uh, but we have to bear in mind that quantum computers as a whole uh, will require, if they do error correction, many more uh, ions ultimately, right? So we have to think about scaling. And I don't necessarily think about scaling all the way to a million in one go, but we should think about how to go beyond uh, our standard regime. And there are various architectures for doing that. One is holding ions above uh, chip structures uh, and shuttling them around, right? And this is sort of an illustration of that where you can find ions in smaller numbers together to do high fidelity gates. And then you actually transport these ions around above a chip yeah, with uh, potentials which are then dynamic, which move the ions around. So what's the challenges of doing that in, in pull traps? Um, the, stand, you know, the standard thing has been to use these radio frequency uh, traps. So there's, there's multiple challenges. One, if you came to the lab, uh, my lab or anyone else's lab, you would find that both the static potentials in a pole trap, uh, they vary strongly. They, they're what produce the harmonic confinement. But the RF potential is also producing strong harmonic confinement. That's how we confine the ions, right? And these two things are both microscopic potentials, but they, are, um, they have to be co-aligned with each other. And one of the problems you have is that if any charge distribution changes, then the static potential will change, but the radio frequency will not change, right? And what that leads to is the fact that you move the center of your trap and you start to get driven radio frequency motion. And that's kind of a pain for the laser ion coupling. Yeah? So a daily thing that's done in the lab is to line up these potentials. And if you think about doing that in complexity in large numbers, that seems like a, a challenge. Yeah? The other, one of the other things that's kind of intrinsic to Laplace's equation again, is that the zero of the RF, uh, of the RF potential is intrinsically a one dimensional thing. And what you see is that I break that in this chip structure because I have these two dimensional junctions. And actually those are quite troublesome in trying to scale up ion trap quantum computing, right? How to deal with the fact that you will have to have large driven RF motion going through junction structures. And then the final one is this heating of these chips. And I think that's best illustrated by this picture from Sandia National Laboratories. Uh, where they just uh, look thermally at their trip while they're, which is suitable for iron trapping, right? And they see the whole thing is, is hot, right? And that's really that there's high voltage radio frequency, sort of tens of volts applied to this chip. And there's some power dissipation and losses in the chip and that's gonna heat the chips up, right? So all of these things uh, make you worry about scaling significantly and they at least present challenges to that. So um, this was in a sense where we started, we were thinking to ourselves about a slightly different problem that I already described about making micro traps with uh, ions trapped in neighboring regions uh, where the ions are close enough together that they could interact with each other. And uh, what we spotted or what we thought was that doing this with independent RF traps, this problem of aligning the two trap potentials and the problems of heating uh, look troublesome. Yeah? So we asked ourselves the question, why, why not just deal with uh, microscopic potentials in the static domain and then have this homogeneous magnetic field to do the confinement, right? And this is what the penning trap offers you to do. Suddenly, instead of having, uh, you know, for 100 ions, 100 different RF, microscopic RF potentials with a null, uh, you just put a homogeneous magnetic field and you do everything in the static domain. So as I said before, the, the challenge with any of these microtrap approaches is to get the ions close enough together. And that kind of forces you to bring them down towards the, the surfaces. Uh, and this is where noise comes from in ion traps is uh, heating due to electric field noise on the surfaces. But one of the advantages of the penning trap there is the fact that everything about your confinement is, is specified from your static potential and not from a radio frequency potential. 
So actually what you find if you look at the curvatures of these potentials is that you, to make a, a pull trap stable, uh, you need to use, uh, for a given voltage, you get about a 16th of the trap, or a, a quarter of the trap frequency, it's the square root of the curvature, re relative to what you get for just a static potential, right? So the panning trap here wins in the sense that if you have a finite voltage you can reach, and you're asking to make an array with a certain spacing, you can get higher trap frequencies for the panning trap relative to what you could ever do for the RF trap, right? So there's a slight win there. It's not the biggest win, but it's a useful one, I think. Uh, and so what we find is that um, for reasonable parameters, we think that these uh, essentially the splittings of the calm and the stretch type motion uh, could be uh, on the level of tens of kilohertz, which is higher than I think is probably possible in the in pull traps. Yeah. And one uh, sort of cool thing once you go into 2D is to think about uh, what this means, right? Uh, these sort of distances between trap sites, then you only need to have a one centimeter by one centimeter chip if it's filled with trap sites. Actually, you get to fairly significant numbers of ions, right? Uh, and uh, I don't think we're gonna get there in one step by any means, right? But uh, we already make one centimeter squared chips. They just aren't covered with trap sites today, right? And um, we couldn't possibly control anything like 250,000 ions. In fact, uh, this project at the moment lives in theory and we try and load one ion maybe in the autumn, yeah. So uh, the perspective looked interesting to us. I think that's what I wanted to say. So uh, what did we have to do? We had to actually figure out if it's possible, right? Uh, so one of the things we did was to look at uh, what the normal modes of motion would be of this system. So in these sort of lattices, you can uh, specify your potential. You can ask where are the ions trapped relative to the centers of the potential, right? And one of those is the circles. And this is us trying to do a hexagonal lattice. We have to then solve these coupled oscillator equations that you saw before for a single ion, but with a Coulomb interaction, it's much more uh, complicated, right? But nevertheless, we came up with a theory for that that could split things into a kinetic energy term, essentially, uh, a magnetic field term, an electric field term, including the Coulomb interaction to solve for these uh, normal modes. Yeah. I won't talk about that. That was a nice result that came from the maths that uh, my student Trey and Shane uh, spotted in the, in the theory of all of this. So what are the interactions you get between oscillators at the different sites? So you can think about a, an ion here and an ion here, and they oscillate in uh, along the axis. That's their axial confinement. And then they have this strange cyclotron and magnetron motion. And who knows what those interactions are going to look like between the two ions and what the normal modes will look like. Yeah. So they have a certain distance and we can specify that distance relative to the magnetic field vector, right? And so then what we see is terms where we have essentially hopping between different sites. So this was this coupling that leads to mode splitting that I showed you in the last lecture. Uh, and basically we find for all the modes that it's got a dipole-dipole type form. And actually what's weird about it is all the dipoles look like they're pointing along the magnetic field, even though the radial motions are going around the magnetic field. In fact, uh, I wasn't aware of this, but if you uh, are aware of this, then you're probably immediately spotted that if you have rotating dipoles in a plane, actually that somehow the, in the interactions, the moments that come up look like the oscillating dipoles coming out of the plane. And stuff like that. Yeah. So this is what really was uh, going on. But for us, it was a surprise initially. Yeah. So one of the other interesting things about the penning trap is that uh, you've got a splitting frequency, which is proportional essentially to the zero point motion of the modes squared. Yeah. And in the axial motion, that's perfectly normal. This is what you'd expect for a harmonic oscillator. The zero point motion is sort of h bar divided by 2m times the frequency of the oscillator square root. Uh, and here you see the frequency of the oscillator appearing. In the penning trap, you've got a slightly strange motion in this radial plane. And what that leads to is actually not the frequency of the mode sitting there, but for both the magnetron and cyclotron motions, you get the difference frequencies of the two modes uh, sitting there. And that's an intriguing feature for, because even making keeping the two frequencies of the modes high, you can make this small and this makes then interactions large, right? So this is a new tunable parameter. And I should just say that's not very explored in previous work because it, nearly everybody worked in a regime where the cyclotron uh, mode was basically much higher than the axial mode was then much higher than the magnetron mode. These are the frequencies of these modes uh, as a function of like how much magnetic field is applied. 
And in a sense, this regime comes when you close this gap between the two modes and it's all the way down here in a totally different regime of operation, but we think one that's accessible for us. So uh, the nice thing about having arrays uh, which are defined by patterning electrodes is that you think you should be able to design what those look like. Uh, so for instance, you know, you can think about whether you go for hexagonal lattice patterns, but there's even interesting aspects with relation to the magnetic field as a compared to the uh, plane of the lattice. So imagine that the plane of ions is in this direction and I change this angle theta then we can look at what the normal modes are. And even within just one of the bands, then we can see that the, for some angles of the magnetic field, there's a band gap essentially. Uh, and this band gap closes up for other angles of the magnetic field. So somehow we can choose normal mode structures, I think, to do interesting physics here. I don't know quite what the best physics to investigate is. We've chosen to be uh, a one particular parameter set for our first experiment, but I think there's uh, lots of flexibility and possibility for interesting models. So I just wanted to mention this enhanced zero point motion. Uh, I won't go into the physics of it, but it's got all sorts of nice features. It increases the couplings between separated ions. It increases the coupling to laser fields. Uh, the bad side is that it probably increases the, the heating rate of the ions, though kind of a nice feature is it still samples the noise at the bare frequency of the oscillator, we think at the moment. So we're kind of intrigued by that feature. Uh, I see I'm running out of time, so let me just uh, quickly say that we've sketched out then a model for doing uh, quantum computing in a lattice, which had very promising parameters for us. We were uh, happy to see, if you like. But the other thing that it frees us up with in the context of quantum computing is uh, one of the things we look towards is this quantum CCD architecture where ions are moved around in 2D. But one of the really big challenges, as I said before, was going through these two-dimensional junction regions because this RF pseudopotential is fundamentally a 1D uh, null. Yeah? Uh, so just an example of that, here's a design in my lab by one of my students. And what we would see coming into the junction is actually that the driven motion of the RF is three microns, which compared to the ground state wave function is a hundred times the size. So anything we don't do well here has a potential to severely impact uh, the performance of this system uh, in, in terms of its control. And the nice thing in the penning trap is no RF, right? So basically, because the magnetic field is homogeneous, then what one needs to be able to do is just to move ions using their static potentials. And there's no real constraint on that. You can move in three dimensions as long as you move these static potentials in three dimensions. So the flexibility of tuning around these traps should be greatly increased and should facilitate much parallelization, if you like, of the control. So all of a sudden, we think it's interesting to pursue even, and maybe that's more interesting from, uh, as, as a sort of jump, it may be more interesting than the quantum simulation to go directly for quantum computing. So uh, are we realizing it? Well, we have uh, the magnet. It looks a bit like Thomas the Tank Engine at the moment. It's got a chimney, right, and, and a big case. Uh, we're starting to put together the vacuum system. It's being tested in the last weeks. We've made chips and things like that. So here are the open questions. Uh, can we get good coherence? Can we load at all? Uh, and what are the heating rates like in these small penning traps where there's no RF? Like, that's actually a fairly fundamental problem uh, that everybody who measured a heating rate in an iron trap till date had high voltage RF applied, which presumably drives processes in the electrodes. And it would be very, very nice to just measure that in a static situation, which the penning trap provides. So with that, then uh, I thank you for your attention. I hope you've got more questions and uh, I just point out some of the people who inspired our ideas, uh, they're highlighted in red, if you like, and who have been working on this particular project. Thanks, thanks for the very nice um, lecture. I think there are a couple of questions, at least the one I see new one from Obhijit. Um, a general question, can you elaborate on your statement that 1 million ions are required to build a quantum computer? Yeah, sure. So, I mean, the, uh, um, essentially, if you want to do uh, a quantum computing with um, error correction, and you want your error rates to be low enough, then you can do estimates of um, uh, what you need to do, for instance, uh, the example that probably comes up with this 1 million ions, I have two examples in mind. One is to do Shor's algorithm uh, with, an, uh, so the error rate that I think I've seen quoted that you might need is about uh, gate 
errors on a logical qubit of around uh, one part in 10 to the 15 to make a Shor's algorithm work. And you might need um, the 1,000 qubits that, are perf that, that have that error rate. Yeah. And then what that means, if you look at some code like the surface code, is that basically means you need a factor of 1,000 in qubits to be able to correct errors to that degree, even if you have fundamental in your lab gate errors of uh, one part in 10 to the three or better that we like, well, I should say that even if the error rates that you achieve are a factor of 10 or so better than we can achieve in the lab today, then you still would require this factor of a thousand overhead, yeah. The same is roughly true for doing quantum chemistry uh, to, to in a fault tolerance setting. So of course you would say, well, but lots of people think they can build a quantum computer today, right? Uh, I would say that yes, but those systems are highly faulty, right? So it's a gamble. It's a question of, can you find things that uh, allow you on a very faulty machine that basically works half the time or something? Uh, can you find any advantage out of that machine from the fact that quantum mechanics gives you more power than classical physics for computing? Uh, I think nobody knows the answer to that question. A lot of people are putting a lot of money gambling that the question is yes, yeah. Uh, and you will find a variety of opinions, probably people who work in business and need to raise cash need to um, be more positive about that statement than I would, but that's basically an unknown, I think, genuine. Yeah. So we might strike lucky, but I think anyone who would say, this is when we know a quantum computer could offer you an advantage would have to tell you, but it will require a million and it'll require them operating a factor of 10 better than we can today uh, and requires, yeah, this sort of scale of device. Yeah. So my statement would usually be that, you know, uh, for these, anyway, my interest is often more cited on error correction than algorithms, but uh, for these sort of error corrected systems, then this is why there's still many years to go before we build quantum computers that are serious. Yeah. But much interesting physics to be done on the way there, I should say, right? So I, I'm very enthusiastic about today's devices, but um, they're not necessarily computers. Yeah, that's what I would say. Okay, I think that's uh, uh, one. I have a question regarding the, um, when you mentioned that you are interested to measure the heating rate, this is a mm -hmm. big debate um, always with traps and particularly surface traps. Now, what is um, what do you think it would be? And it's a prediction, right? <laughs> uh, yeah, I think I wouldn't like to say because it's um, the heating rate is not a well understood, like what's the cause of this noise is not a well understood process, right? So um, I can only, I think my only statement would be that, you know, a lot of it seems to be some sort of uh, activated process of migration on the chip surfaces. Uh, and to me, having high voltages oscillating backwards and forwards with light particles, like, you know, uh, the sort of charges you get in materials, seems to be something that potentially has, will affect what goes on uh, in those on surfaces, yeah? So in that sense, then I think uh, it will be very interesting just to get rid of that for once in a while. <laughs> uh, and uh, to me, it's quite an important data point actually to maybe give us more information actually about what we could do about this. Um, but, um, so if I understand you correctly, that you would expect to see less here, uh, at least the scaling would be lower compared yeah, to- Yeah, like, I would more say that I would hope to see less. I guess expect would say that I had a theory of what's going on, um, and I wouldn't say we have a good theory of what's going on. So right, right, right. It's a very open question there. Yep. So any other question from... <laughs> Sorry, there is a question here. Can we go through it now? Yes, uh, okay. you can take that question. Okay, so this is from Noah again. I think the question is, what are the limitations of this spinning ion lattices from the point of view of quantum computing? Yeah, okay, so I didn't mention that. So I guess, did I mention the frequency at which they're spinning somewhere? No, probably not. Yeah. So let me just say it here. So the the sort of frequency at which you have to spin this thing up, and now you have to imagine that this is rotation, uh, is sort of 160 kilohertz or something like that, yeah, or tens of kilohertz, let's say. So what this means is that this picture here, which looks very beautiful, and it is very beautiful, is actually taken with a stroboscopic uh, camera, right? Every once in a cycle, you, you go looking for the fluorescence, right? Uh, 
Uh, and so one of the challenges in trying to build that into a quantum computing system is then uh, not only to do imaging like that, but also have individual laser beams, arrays of laser beams that you have to get into a bore of a magnet, for instance, uh, which can then address individual sites uh, in this lattice and, and perform control there. Yeah? The other challenge in this sort of any sort of structure like this is that uh, though I talked primarily about these drumhead axial type motion, there are in-plane modes of this lattice too, and these are at low frequencies, right? Uh, ultimately, it comes down to a situation where I would call this a bulk system. And bulk systems, uh, if they are highly anisotropic, tend to have low frequency modes, which are existing, yeah, structural type modes. And that's what's happening here. These in-plane modes are actually uh, magnetron type modes, right? And they're at low frequencies and there is a lot of them. And what they lead to is just, uh, it's a many body system. It's a more complex system. It's, uh, uh, they lead to instabilities and things that we wouldn't necessarily see in results, right? But they're hard things to work with, yeah. Uh, and I think that's sort of true. Um, if you think about scaling these systems up, essentially you will run into the limits of those sort of problems Yeah, at some point. The other thing to say is that in, indeed to have a larger and larger crystal at some point, uh, if you think about me talking about a million, then you, you start to get to size scales, which are quite considerable and, and need voltages that are high or whatever. And, uh, and so some of those considerations are sort of longer term challenges, I think. But, you know, one of the states of the art uh, things that they're doing in, in this system today is trying to get this more local control, right? And part of that is um, uh, part of that is stroboscopic. And one thing they've actually done there recently, which I didn't have time to put in, was to put in essentially um, standing wave structures which um, rotate along with the crystal at some level. Yeah. Uh, and these then allow you to imprint a, a static in the rest frame of the ions, a static structure, which gives you some individual control. Yeah, but this is still something in development. So it's still something that they, uh, it's not easy for them to do that. Yeah. Yeah. Okay, um, I think there is a last, um, I think it's more a very open question. It's uh, if we have to buy a quantum computer, what should one look in terms of um, rating, which I, uh, I guess yeah, it, in terms yeah. of quality, I guess. Yeah, I think the, I mean, probably, you probably want to know, as with any computer, right? You probably want to know what you want to do with it at some level, right? Uh, so there's probably some particular algorithm. And then I think we're in a very nascent period in, with respect to doing these algorithms, right? Because uh, there are many factors that will affect both how large your computer is, i.e. how much error correction do you need is a major question, which relates not just to the rate of errors, that's kind of a simplistic notion, but also what type your errors are. Do they have correlations that are spatial? Do they have correlations in time? And if you like, this is the frontier of research in quantum error correction experimentally, at least, is discovering how different types of errors, not theorists' errors necessarily propagate in these complex systems, actually, yeah. Uh, and in the presence of measurement and feedback and all of these sort of aspects, yeah. So um, I think it's very hard to make predictions about what systems will uh, come out in front in the end. That's why, in a sense, lots of systems still exist, yeah. You can point to certain features that would say you can win. So, I, you know, as an iron trapper, I would probably say, well, look, our error rates for two cubic gates are the lowest, right? Uh, and that will enable us to build a smaller computer with less error correction, and hopefully that's a, a good thing, yeah? On the other hand, in superconducting qubits, they might say, well, yeah, but every gate you do is 100 times slower than the gates we do, yeah? And that's a totally valid point, yeah? But I would then say, but your noise is worse, and how do you deal with that? So I think this, in a sense, you know, the reason I got into this field in the first place was because what I like is you can go to a conference uh, and uh, there are people working in solid state physics and people working in atomic physics and people working in other stuff and they all kind of speak the same language, right? Because they have this common set of things that they're trying to do with very diverse systems. And it's still fun to me to see how the thinking of those diverse systems uh, plays off each other. We've had a very nice relationship, for instance, with the uh, Sholkov group at Yale or Deveret group at Yale in terms of some of the emotional codes that I tried to show you last week. 
where their ideas sprung our ideas and the same thing happened in reverse. And it's because we were doing the same things in different systems, yeah? And this is where innovation kind of feels like it came from in that sense. I, I very much enjoyed that. So I think with this very nice notes, we can close this session. Um, it's uh, very nice lectures, John, thanks for, for, for the lectures. I believe the students gained a lot from this. Thank you, take care. Listening and uh, yeah, thanks for the questions.